And with that, I would like to welcome everyone to our webinar Wednesday. Uh, today it's hosted by and presented by L.R. Kimball. And the topic is, so you want to build a hangar. We are joined today by Rick Holes. And Rick is uh, the Director of Aviation and Civil Engineering for L.R. Kimball, which is now a division of Trans Systems. Uh, Rick has worked for L.R. Kimball since graduating from the Pennsylvania State University with a bachelor's degree in civil engineering in 1989. Rick, you're dating yourself. Yeah, he's <laughs> he spent several years doing highway design and land development engineering before moving into aviation in 1995. Rick was a board member for the Aviation Council of Pennsylvania from 2003 to 2019. Thank you for your service. And he was also our president of ACP for, for 2010 and 2011. And he was also our past president for countless years. <laughs> uh, we're also joined by his colleague, Fran Strauss. Uh, Fran is a senior project manager for L.R. Kimball's most challenging projects in Pennsylvania and the mid-Atlantic states. He has over 46 years of experience in airport planning, environmental engineering, and construction management. Fran has assisted the FAA, state aviation offices, and ASEO in implementing various innovative solutions to challenging problems. Fran is uh, our secretary for the Aviation Council of Pennsylvania. He's an alternate to the Governor's Aviation Advisory Committee uh, and its member and member and a member of uh, its Hangar Development and Funding Subcommittee, uh, the Delaware Valley Regional Planning Commission's Regional Airport Committee. So thank you both Rick and Fran for joining us today. Uh, I'd like to let our guests know that Fran and Rick will be available for questions following their presentation. So feel free to use the Q&A function found at the bottom of your screen to submit your questions. And with that, Fran and Rick, I turn it over to you. Thank you, Mary. So we want to build a hangar. So we're going to spend the next hour or so uh, going over all of the uh, items that go into your decision to build a hangar and uh, what you're going to go through as you go through the really the planning, design, and construction of the project. There is a, a litany of information here, uh, way more than we can cover in an hour. So at the end, we'll give you our contact information. You can feel free to contact us if you have any, any additional questions or comments, concerns. So our agenda, we're gonna, we, we kind of called this Hangers 101. Uh, we're gonna talk about why you wanna build hangers, the different types of hangers you can look at, what types fit your needs the most, where to locate them on your airport, the hangar design considerations. Now, I will go through those topics. And then Fran will start talking about his hangar development checklist, how to fund your hangar. And we'll, we'll finish up with some hangar project examples. So why build some hangars? Um, as we just talked about a few minutes ago, uh, the a Aviation Council, AOPA, and the Aviation Advisory Committee recently completed a uh, hangar survey within Pennsylvania, and uh, we've basically determined that we are we are definitely lacking hangars, uh, particularly in the more developed regions of, of the state. Most airports have a hangar waiting list. Um, you know, we are the engineer for Bucks County, uh, and the uh, the hangar waiting list at Doylestown Airport has been around 180 since the mid 1990s when we started working there. So there's, a, there's certainly a, a, a hangar waiting list at most airports within the state. Um, older hangars are, are, are being condemned and, and need to be replaced. The hangar supply is not keeping up with the, the demand. And uh, you know, we've had, especially in mostly the Philly region, but we've had some closures of, uh, of airports in that, in that area. So you know, every time an airport closes, there's a bunch of airplanes that have to go somewhere. And uh, you know, that really is, is a, an issue in the high density areas of Philadelphia and Pittsburgh. 
And then lastly, the, the escalation of construction costs really make uh, constructing a hangar a, a pretty expensive endeavor. Additionally, uh, one of the things that we've always found is that uh, hangar rentals are the top revenue generator for most GA airports. So building new hangars makes a lot of sense if you want to increase your revenue. Talk about the different types of hangers. So I, I'm willing to bet that every person listening to this knows what a tea hanger is. A um, couple of different types of tea hangers. You have the smaller types of tea hangers where you can store a single engine or maybe a light twin aircraft. Uh, they're usually 42 feet wide, 41 foot, six inch door. And they typically rent from 150 to $500 a month, depending on where you are in the state. Larger tea hangers go up to 48 foot. So you can either have a 45 foot door or a 48 foot door. You store your larger twins in those or small jets. Um, you know, they're gonna rent for typically 250 to 750 a month. We have uh, modified tea hangers that we've done in the past few years, or as uh, John Martin down at New Garden called them, super tea hangers. Uh, that, those hangers combine a, uh, the storage space into the tea hanger. And then you can use that storage space for vehicle parking or an office or storage or whatever you, know, whatever you wanna do. Talk a little bit about the two different types of hangers. We have standard hangers, which have the, the nose tail nose configuration. And we typically don't see too many of those being built these days. Most of the hangers that are built, being built now are, are nested T hangers. They have a tail to tail configuration and I'll show what those look like. However, if you have a real long, narrow site, standard tees can work very well for that site. They're only about 32 feet wide, um, you know, but you do need access to both sides. Nested tees are anywhere from 50 to 60 feet wide, depending on the size that you look at. This is just a diagram showing the difference between a standard tee hanger on the bottom, nested tee hanger on the top. And you know, the typical hanger is about 1,000 to 1,200 square feet. In, in size. Unit hangers um, are typically those, those hangers where you store one or more aircraft. Um, there's three different types of unit hangers. There's the small pre-engineered buildings, the, un the unit hangers that erect a tube or full fab uh, produce. They range in size from about 42 feet wide by 33 feet deep to 65 feet wide by 56 feet deep. Um, these are typically rectangular. You can combine them with T hangers, put them at the end of the T hangers uh, and, and things like that to, to increase your, your storage capacity. And typically in these hangers, you can store several small aircraft or up to uh, two King Air sized aircraft. I think at York Airport, uh, we have the largest of the hangers, the 65 by 56. And I'm pretty sure we keep, uh, they keep two King Air sized aircraft in those hangers. Once you get to a little bit larger than that, you start to go into the small architectural hangers. That's where you need to have a, uh, typically have an architect on board to design the hangar. We typically take these up to about 12,500 square feet, which I'll talk about here in a little bit. But, <clears throat> excuse me, these can include door widths up to 100 feet or more. Um, use them to store up to really your largest corporate aircraft, which is a, a, a G6, Gulf Stream 6, is essentially 100 by 100. The, the footprint is 100 by 100. 100 feet foot wingspan, 100 foot length. You know, so when you're doing an architectural unit hangar, you know, we, we typically design for something like a Gulf Stream size aircraft. The doors for those aircraft need to be 28 feet clear. Um, so, the, you know, that really gets into some pretty large doors. Then the, the, the even bigger hangers are the, the much larger ones that go up to, you know, 200, 300 feet in size, where you can store multiple large jets, uh, you know, the business, the large business jets, like the BBJs or the Airbus business jet, or an MRO facility. And, uh, you know, those, those typically have a 35 to 42 or 43 foot door. Um, we did a uh, large unit hanger uh, for a, a confidential client in New York. They wanted to store four Gulf Streams in it. 
It was a 240 foot wide by 220 foot deep hanger. Um, so and that you get into the, the large hangers uh, to store the, the larger aircraft. Different types of unit hangers. Again, you know, these are the, the pre-engineered where you can stack them together. And then the small architectural unit hangers. The one that we have shown here is two 75 by 75 foot hangers together to create a 75 by 150 foot uh, building. What types of hangers do you need? Um, you know, really, that's the big that's the big question. How big do you need to be? Does the hanger need to be? What size door do you need? Start with your hanger waiting list. Look at who wants to come to your airport. Who wants to have a hanger? We we'll interview them and do a, a summary of, of what they're they're looking for. The other thing to do is do a hanger inventory. I'm going to talk about that coming up. But really, once a year, you should be out there checking all of your hangers to see who's in there, what they have stored in there, and are you using are you utilizing the space that you have in the best way possible? Get the input from your tenants. Consider consider having the tenants put some skin in the game. Get them to pay at least pay a deposit so that you don't build these hangers and you have a field of dreams concept where you build them and hope they'll come to your airport. Mix hangers types and sizes so you can have the most, most flexibility. Um, we will we typically try to talk people out of doing small T hangers because they limit the number of the limit the types of aircraft that you can store in them and what you can charge. And group hangers, if you are gonna build a group hanger, you have to have somebody that is going to move the aircraft in and out of the hangar. Do not allow the tenants to do that. That's a recipe for disaster. So a hangar inventory. We happened to do this Bedford County Airport when they were looking at building a new corporate hangar. And we said, you know, they kept saying they, they didn't have any space available. So uh, Fran and the airport director uh, did a, uh, a hangar inventory, spent an afternoon going through each hangar. What we found out was that one of the T hangers was completely empty. So they, they were not collecting any rent from one of the T hangers. Uh, one of the other T hangers had a glider stored in. Well, a glider could be stored in a storage unit very easily. So there's another hangar that could have been available to put a, a, an aircraft in. We had another hangar that had two ultralights stored in it. Uh, so, you know, really we found three hangars, just by doing this hangar inventory, we found three T hangars that weren't, they weren't getting the full amount of, of rent or uh, value out of those T hangars that they could have. Then the corporate hangars, they had three corporate hangars. One of them, the top one, uh, I'm sorry, not the top one, the second one had two jets stored in it, two gliders, an RV and an Airstream trailer. Well, the RV and the Airstream trailer should not be stored in a hangar. And I'm guessing they weren't getting any rent for those. And then if you look at the lower hangar, they had a Citation Sovereign stored in one half. The other half, they had three very small aircraft paying $150 a month. So in a hangar where they should have been getting about $1,500 a month, they were getting 450 by storing these three small aircraft. And oh, by the way, they had three T hangar units available where these three small aircraft could have been stored. So your hangar inventory is very important. Again, we recommend probably once a year, you take, a, take the, the time and go through and do exactly what we have shown here. Go through, list who's in each one, how much money you're getting for each and determine whether you're best utilizing the space you have. Next, you want to look at how, where to locate the hangars on your airport. First of all, wind, or the direction you want them to face is very important. You have the, the hangars facing west, particularly in Pennsylvania, more likely you're going to have wind into the doors at all times, especially if you have your doors open and your, your tenants aren't going to be real happy with that. However, north-facing hangars are definitely going to have icing problems in the winter. We've had to typically put um, ice dams on the uh, on the hangars, or uh, and and trench drains, so that we can keep the uh, or heat the north sides 
to make sure that we don't have icing problems. So where should you put them on your airfield? Look at your taxi length. Don't put them on the end of the runway when the primary end is on the other side and you have a mile taxi for all your tenants to get to the primary end of the runway. Um, you know, take that into consideration. Is there direct access to a parallel taxiway? How long does it take to get to the parallel? And then most importantly, especially today, you know, these airplanes are, are very valuable and there's a lot of, a lot of equipment there, but they're also very vulnerable um, to fee-free and people breaking in and stealing things out of the aircraft or stealing parts. So you definitely want the, the aircraft to be secure, visible, whether it's via cameras or uh, internet or something like that to either the FBO or the airport office. How are they gonna, how are the tenants gonna get to the hangars? Where are they gonna park? And then also remember, you know, part 77. You need to take, keep that in mind as, as you're laying out the hangars. Hangar site designs. Um, we talked a little bit about these, but you know, how are you gonna get to and from the, the hangars on the airfield? And with your vehicles, where are you gonna park the vehicles? Security, you're gonna have bathrooms or not? What type of paving do you need? Uh, you know, stormwater management, everything that goes into the hangar site design. These are the, the can, things you have to think about when for the hangar building itself. The exterior, what's it gonna look like? What color are you gonna use? Do you have, is it gonna match everything else that you have? What type of roof are you gonna put on? Type of, what loadings are you gonna have? Those will come for your codes. What type of doors do you want? This has a bifold door. You want a bifold or a sliding door? You want a, a, one of the higher power doors, the single that just flip up? You, you can use a fabric door. You want office space in the hangar. What types of siding? The interior hangers, you know, just a litany of decisions to be made. And Fran's gonna talk about this with his hangar checklist. The hangar design. Um, you know, this is probably one of the more important things that, that you will go through. First of all, permitting is gonna mandate a lot of your design. Uh, your municipal codes, and in Pennsylvania, typically most municipalities use the International Building Code. Um, International Building Code treats hangars as a garage. And uh, for small airports, and, and we're also working with the Aviation Council to try to get the legislature to exempt small airports from these building codes for their, their hangars. Because it's, it's really, the, the new building codes have really increased the cost of hangar construction significantly. But IBC is gonna determine whether you need fire, uh, firewalls in the hangars. You may have to have handicapped accessibility, what load requirements you're gonna require. Your zoning may require parking. Um, is honestly, you know, in, in all the airports where we've built parking for T hangers, uh, Doylestown Airport, for example, has an 18 space parking lot next to an area where there are 60 T hangers. I've never seen more than two cars in that lot um, since they were built in 1997. Um, it's stupid, but most municipalities are going to require you to build some parking for your T hangers or for your hangers. And then the ADA compliance, again, th this, this makes life very difficult because instead of having the door built into the bifold door, you have to have the door flush with the ground and, and it doesn't work built into the bifold door. So you have to enlarge the hanger to put the ADA compliant door. Utilities, you, for the electric, you can have individual meters or a gang meter. You may have one guy that's doing a lot of it a lot of work in his hangar and the other person's doing none. Really the person using the electricity should be paying for it. Communications, more, this is more important today than ever before, uh, having communications and Wi-Fi available at the hangar complex. Type of, uh, are you gonna provide heat in the hangars? You're gonna provide restrooms in the hangars. If you are, we're gonna need water and sewer. And then significant or sufficient lighting, uh, both inside and outside of the hangars. Foundation design, again, that'll come from the, uh, from the municipal code for your, your loading requirements. Um, we recommend 
particularly for tea hangers, a perimeter wall that extends below the frost line. If you don't have a perimeter wall and you don't extend it below the frost line, in the winter you will get heaving and you may or may not be able to close your hanger doors. So this perimeter wall makes it, uh, really makes it a lot better for, for winter use. What types of floors are you gonna have? Um, you know, the, the cheapest you can do is gravel. Uh, most expensive is typically concrete. Um, but also whatever you do, make sure they drain from the middle of the hangers to the doors. You wanna make sure that the, the water can get out, you know, especially if you have snow melt or uh, you've been out, your aircraft's been out in the rain. What types of doors? Uh, most tea hangers are, they prefer uh, bifold doors. A lot of older tea hangers have sliding doors, but in the winter, when you, especially when you get a large snow, uh, large snowstorm or anything, you know, I, I've heard of tenants where it's been a week or more that they couldn't get their door open because of snow or ice. So sliding doors aren't, aren't the greatest for tea hang. Great for large unit hangers, probably the best door you can get for a large unit hanger is a sliding door. Fold up doors you can get, fabric doors. We, we have uh, quite a few uh, airports that utilize fabric doors. Um, they work very well. They seem to stand up pretty well. Um, again, you have to worry about the direction. If, the, if it's into the wind, the fabric doors are a little bit difficult to use sometimes. Insulation and venting. Uh, definitely want roof insulation, control condensation within the hangers. Um, typically provide at least a ridge vent, but we prefer turbine vents for unit hangers. We also prefer fans in unit hangers just to, uh, for, for heating and for uh, cooling in, in those hangers. Partitions, particularly for, for tees. Uh, you want full height partitions or partial height. Uh, otherwise you have free access from hanger to hang. You might get somebody that screws around with somebody else's plane. So if you have the partitions in there, uh, you know, that can help reduce that, that issue. Storage units. Um, T hangers will always come with a, a, a unit on the end. You can either build it into the hanger, or use it as a storage unit. We have a lot of airports that use either park either small helicopters or gliders in those storage units. Um, you can use it for airport storage. Put a garage door on and uh, park some of your airport equipment in there, tractors, you know, small trucks, things like that. The apron, uh, first of all, you want the, the apron to be slightly below the hanger foundation so you don't get ice and rain from uh, getting into the hanger. You, the typical slopes, half percent is the, the minimum you wanna build, but one and a half percent is the max. So somewhere in that sweet spot between a half percent, one and a half percent on your on your aprons. Drainage, uh, we typically, especially for tea hangers, we use an inverse crown system, put uh, drainage in the low spots, put inlets in about every hundred feet. Uh, you want to make sure those areas drain. Consider trench drains and roof gutters. If, you know, one of the things that you get, uh, again, in the winter, you may have if you don't have roof gutters, you have the, the water dripping off and then at night, everything freezes and you have a skating rink. Your roof, provide at least 12 inches of overhang to shed the water away from the hanger. Use the snow guards to prevent snow and ice from sliding off the roof. And you can consider other things like skylights, insulation, ridge vents, gutters, et cetera. My final slide, uh, bidding. We typically, especially for uh, publicly funded projects, we typically use three bid packages. First one is the hangar procurement and acquisition. We do that pretty, pretty much early on. And then what that does is it tells you what hangar you're gonna use. You're gonna use full fab, you're gonna use a rectal tube, you're gonna use something else. And then that helps you to finish up the design for the foundations of the, uh, the footers and foundations for the hangar. Site prep is a separate project, and then you have the hangar erection and fit out. You need the hangar procurement and the hangar erection to work together because somebody's got to receive the hangar, unload it, get everything stored, and then build the hangar for you. Um, again, make sure strict breakdowns between who's responsible. Um, you know, the hangar erection contractor really should be brought on board pretty early 
to make sure that they're going to they're going to do everything you need them to do. Standard T hanger or stand, standard hanger manufacturers, erect a tube, full fab. They're very helpful throughout the entire process. You can go to them and they will help you through the entire design, bidding, and construction process. We typically recommend, especially for T's, that you utilize either erect a tube or full fab. Um, and even for the, the small pre engineered hangers, use those because, they, again, it just makes life a lot easier for everybody. Um, where the non standard hanger manufacturers um, don't, don't fit in as much code compliance, they, don't know, they aren't going to know your codes, cost estimating, um, you, know, you may or may not be able to get a good cost estimate from them, and then standard drawings. They typically have to develop the standard drawings that you'll get after you bid them. Um, consider alternate bid items like different types of floors, uh, the partitions, things like that. Stay within budget. Uh, again, complete the procurement very early in the design. In today's market, be prepared to act quickly. Steel prices are changing weekly, sometimes more than weekly. So if you don't, if you wait two weeks to say, okay, yep, this is what we're going to do. You, you may increase the, your steel prices by 10%, maybe 20%. And lastly, make sure you value engineer your hangers as you go through the, the project. Um, again, working with a, a full fab or a rectitude, they will help you with that process. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Fran to uh, finish the presentation. Thank you, Rick. Uh, we'll look at in terms of uh, hangar development and impacts. Uh, we, we have defined that there are various impacts that uh, can affect uh, the airport or, or the sponsors. Uh, one, you want to allow for underutilized parcels on your airport party property to generate uh, substantial increased revenues. Uh, this is so important to be able to uh, maximize your bottom line. Uh, you want to substantially increase your airport fuel sales and the revenue uh, that, that will be derived from the fuel sales. Uh, you wanna increase uh, the on airport employment. That, that will uh, be often the case with, with hangar development. Uh, likewise, uh, you wanna substantially increase the competitiveness of your airport. Uh, and that can be done by hangar development, which will provide further incentives uh, for both the FAA and the Bureau of Aviation to invest in your airport. Uh, you want to look in terms of, a, of those hangars attracting higher quality FBOs or other uh, airport tenants. And likewise, you want to look in terms of how those hangars will promote your municipal economic development. Because often those uh, economic development organizations may be providing you with uh, some local share or realize that uh, they're deriving uh, some particular uh, positive impact from, from your uh, hangar investment. Likewise, uh, uh, in terms of those hurdles, the primary hurdle obviously is funding. Uh, but within the funding, the, the key element uh, is local share. Uh, I'll be going into maybe various funding options. Uh, they may include uh, obviously the, the federal through AIP or your block grant or your non-primary entitlement but uh, state assistance, both the aviation and, and non-aviation state assistance are available for hangar development. The timing, don't think that hangars are going to appear magically the next day. It, it's going to involve a lot of planning, a lot of uh, forecasting of revenues, uh, investment uh, decisions, uh, and, and obviously permitting uh, is part of that uh, and the environmental clearances. The resources uh, that are there, uh, are, are they uh, in line for your uh, overall development? And lastly, as, as Rick had mentioned earlier, the cost escalation. You need to, you need to look and plan for that as that will affect uh, your ability to uh, match your, your grant or other funding considerations. We always do a hangar checklist. Uh, 
before starting a project. Uh, in this case, uh, this is one that I developed for uh, Bedford County. Uh, it was uh, for a uh, 12,000 square foot hangar. And you can see that uh, we looked at the, uh, the, the building requirements first uh, within the hangar. And you can see the various ones that are located there on the right side. We look at the hangars, uh, HVAC components, the electrical components, the space within, looking then at the uh, various offices. If there are going to be offices, we normally recommend those offices be attached and not included in the hangar because it takes up valuable real estate within the hangar that could be used for aircraft storage. So you can see the office's considerations there. And lastly are the site improvements. Particularly, you wanna focus on that stormwater management. We found the stormwater management can often be about uh, 20 to 30% of your all project costs. Rick, uh, some of those hangar considerations, the ownership, uh, if, if in fact the hangar is privately owned, uh, you're gonna be uh, assessed the real estate uh, tax on that improvement. Uh, so whether it is a, a private public use airport or whether it is a private developer or, or, or individuals, uh, real estate tax considerations. If you're a public owner, uh, you wanna look at what that lease is going to be, both in terms of lease provisions today, and then uh, as the lease is terminated and you take ownership of the hangar, what are, what are those considerations that you're gonna have? Management, uh, the aircraft owner relationship, uh, particularly if, if you're dealing with uh, T hangers and, and you're dealing with a condo association, where you may have 10 individual aircraft owners, how, how are you gonna communicate with them and how are you going to, more important, how are you gonna build them? Uh, so uh, all those uh, figures in, figure into the management considerations. Then lastly is the maintenance. As Rick had indicated before, you're gonna have snow, you're gonna have grass to mow uh, and the hangar door is the most important consideration and, and the maintenance, because that's the most costly. It's the one that has the moving parts. Uh, funding for your hangar, uh, there is uh, airport development. Uh, and, and we always recommend that you separate that into a site prep grant and then one for the hangar. Uh, you may also need to get a loan. We often secure loans through the Pennsylvania Infrastructure Bank. Uh, that does provide a very good incentive. Right now, it's about one and five eighth percent uh, interest, uh, but it is for a 10 year loan. So you need to make certain that you can amortize that loan in, in that period. Uh, the private investment, uh, we typically have a ground lease uh, with the uh, airport uh, owner, uh, and then the private uh, entity uh, does uh, the construction or the actual improvement. Uh, there is a private public partnership consideration where the airport itself provides predominantly the site preparation. Uh, and that can include uh, all the stormwater management, all the uh, apron utilities uh, brought to the site. Uh, and then the private entity does the, does the hangar work. And, and that partnership can also work in terms of grant opportunities. Uh, we want to look at also the, those fundings uh, considerations that hangers are eligible for FA funding, but uh, they, they rank low in the national priority system. And also you can only use the non-primary entitlement. So if you're a GA airport, that's $150,000. Uh, you're going to have to save all four of your years to get it up to about 600000 that you can do any type of hangar development. So use, use of uh, FA funding for hangar, it's, it, it's not really going to work that well for you. However, if you can use that funding uh, associated with a uh, eligible project like a, an apron expansion or something like that, where you can also include the stormwater management, for not only the apron, but also for any, any future hangers, you're gonna save considerably on your hanger investment.
Uh, some of those additional funding options, uh, you have the traditional airport owner. Uh, that's where the airport owns the hangar. And, and, and then you got to find a tenant uh, to lease that. Uh, that usually requires uh, an outlay of money by the owner uh, for a period of time. Uh, you're going to be dependent on, on filling those hangars right away to be able to make certain that you're amortizing the loan or your local share investment. And uh, most likely, again, as I said before, uh, you want to look at a, at a loan and particularly the Pennsylvania Infrastructure Bank for that. Uh, then you have the tenant that owns the hangar and the airport uh, is uh, executing a ground lease. Uh, that usually, uh, if you're dealing with a uh, tea hanger, uh, usually requires a group of tenants to band together. Uh, they may form a condo association uh, with that. And uh, then those particular tenants are, are paying all costs uh, for, for the hangar itself. The airport uh, is providing typically a, a long-term lease uh, that's usually recommended as 20 years uh, and possibly then with three five-year renewals will get you to 40. IRS allows that, that tenant or that uh, private entity to amortize or depreciate that investment over 39 years. Uh, but the key thing here is that if you're an airport and you're executing a ground lease, you want to make certain you get a fair market value for that. And then the question always is, what is that? Well, I always say that the ground lease should look at four conditions. One is just raw ground, and, and that may be your base amount uh, per square foot. And then second, if you are able to improve, maybe you're going to provide pad ready, you're going to do some excavation, you're going to provide pad ready. Well, that's going to bump up that base to another value, a higher value per square foot. And then you may look in terms of being able to run some utilities uh, to the site. That's going to bump it up to a third level. And then finally, you may provide some, some overall infrastructure improvement. Maybe you're going to provide uh, an apron uh, to that, and that may get you to the highest value. So look, look in terms of how you may be able to improve that uh, base uh, agreement, uh, and, and with that, provide you with the overall maximum revenue. The other thing is how you provide the ground lease. Uh, you want to look at either the ground lease directly under the hangar or the ground lease as the total area that is being uh, dedicated to that hangar. That, that would be any parking area. That would be any aircraft uh, uh, storage exterior to the hangar, uh, the apron side, so forth to it. So you want to look at how you can maximize that the ground lease also, uh, typically the FAA has now kind of given us a rule of thumb that the first 50 feet of the apron is ineligible. Uh, and therefore you want to look at that being part of the ground lease so that the tenant has responsibility for uh, the maintenance of that. Uh, and likewise, uh, if the state is providing a state local grant in the future, that tenant is responsible for the local share of, of that grant. The hangar develop, lastly, is the hangar developer uh, developing or constructing the hangar and then the airport uh, being the ground lease option. Uh, again, the developer uh, typically uh, is looking for the best opportunity to get in and get out. Uh, they also obviously have the responsibility of how, how they're going to be able to get out by way of either selling that or that uh, long-term lease to them. Uh, you wanna look in terms of how to plan ahead. Uh, you wanna look in terms of, as I mentioned before, uh, the site grading as part of particularly uh, an AIP or block grant project. Uh, you wanna look in terms of the utilities uh, as, as that may also be able to lower the overall development cost of the hangar. Uh, you want to look at some other opportunities uh, with your design and construction of, of taxiways, taxi lanes, and apron. Uh, again, either using your AIP or block grant funds uh, with that. Your airport sponsor uh, in, in procuring the hangar 
you, you want to try to procure the hanger separately uh, because it'll save you money, uh, both in, in the taxes of that. Uh, it'll also eliminate uh, the contra contractor markup and will allow you to deal directly with hanger manufacturers uh, in, in a direct bid to, uh, to them. Also, your uh, foundations, uh, the floors and, and the erection, all that can be a separate contract because that, that's a, a different builder. It's a different contractor. And, and you want to just keep your elements of the hangar construction in those that are specializing in that particular type of contract uh, or construction. That's going to give you the best uh, bidding opportunities and the lowest cost. Uh, you also want to look in terms of uh, the private public partnership. Uh, you, you don't, as an airport, need to, uh, to raise uh, funds for the construction. Private entity uh, can pay a portion of the uh, local cost uh, or any grants. They can also provide uh, the cost for the public uh, portion uh, that you're bidding uh, itself. Uh, the revenue producing, you want to look at uh, a consistent cash flow. That comes from your ground lease and a proper structure of that. It also may mean uh, the, uh, you're getting a certain management fee uh, for a moving aircraft, particularly in and out, though that's really not desirable because you're taking on higher risk associated with that. You want to minimize the construction uh, and management hassles. Uh, you can, the more bids and separate contracts you have, the better uh, you're going to get your lower costs, but it also increases your uh, hassles, if you will, as you have more contractors to deal with. The, the private sector uh, can obviously decrease both the time and the cost of your project. So uh, it is good to look at that, that type of partnership. Uh, likewise, uh, in terms of hangar development, it, it aids in, in the airport growth. Uh, the, the private entity can help uh, in, in marketing your uh, airport uh, through its private uh, marketing sources. Uh, you, you're you're going to obviously increase your based aircraft. Uh, and that may also mean that you're going to increase uh, your commission fees, i.e. your aircraft fuel flowage. Uh, and it may also help you maintain your federal eligibility. We know that uh, many of our, our smaller uh, airports, uh, particularly in the rural areas, are, are losing uh, based aircraft. And, and as you need to maintain to your federal eligibility, you need at least 10 based aircraft. So hangar development is going to work with you in that respect. Uh, it's going to also obviously uh, relieve you of at least a portion of your waiting list. Uh, that encourages, obviously, uh, your pilots to uh, make more uh, utilization of, of your airport, and with that, increase your revenue. And lastly, uh, let me look at uh, a, what I call a hangar decision matrix. Sometimes uh, when we work through the numbers, uh, both in terms of uh, how you're going to fund the, that whether it be through various grants and, and eligibilities of those, or whether again, it's through loans, or whether again, it's looking at uh, your overall capability to rent a portion or all the hangers. So we look at all those uh, considerations, uh, how much money uh, you're going to need to raise for local share, how you're gonna do that through maybe a loan consideration and what interest rates that may be and then uh, how long uh, do you have to pay back that? Uh, we look at uh, the overall consideration of how you're going to market those spaces within the hangar, the various types of aircraft, the various types of uh, rental rates you may get from those. All that enters into a decision matrix, a break even point. And often we've got to tell uh, an airport uh, you know, your market just doesn't merit that consideration. Uh, but if it does, here are some of the key things that you need to consider to make certain that you're maximizing that. And often the loan is a 10-year loan. So you may just 
be breaking even or just doing a little bit better than even in the first 10 years. But realize the life of the hanger is about 40 years. So the next 30 years, it's all gravy. So you need to consider that in terms of a long-term type of decision, not just immediate. Uh, we look at revenue projections uh, for an airport. In this case here, uh, we looked at uh, 10 box hangers. These were 60 by 60, uh, basically able to uh, use a corporate aircraft like a King Air. And we uh, looked at how the airport could improve uh, the ground uh, and, and with that, uh, get a better dollar per square foot uh, for that consideration. We looked at how those uh, King Air aircraft would generate fuel sales, uh, in this case at 10 cents per gallon, uh, and looking at how that amount of gallonage would result in uh, about uh, uh, $70,000 uh, a year uh, in, in fuel flowage. And then we looked uh, for the case of the airport owned by the county, how the county would re also receive uh, taxes uh, for those uh, uh, 10 corporate aircraft that the hangar developer would uh, produce. And so uh, we looked over 10 years uh, as an as a initial payback. And you could see there that uh, the fuel flowage uh, plus the ground rent uh, produced about a million dollars of revenue and the county also about 150,000 in, in tax revenue. So overall 1.2 million uh, was the overall uh, impact and uh, a, a very positive one. But also we look at risk and uh, that is an important consideration when you're considering hangar development. Uh, if, the low, if the risk is low, you as the airport have the advantage. If the risk is high, you wanna throw that onto the, the developer or that private entity. And then uh, lastly, let me uh, summarize by looking at the various considerations. Uh, funding, uh, in, in terms of uh, AIP, as I mentioned, you wanna look in terms of trying to couple that with an eligible project like an apron expansion, particularly in terms of, of stormwater management. Uh, the overall funding in, in state aviation funding uh, well, if you're a public entity, capital budget funding is, is definitely an option for you. If, if uh, you're not, or if you are, uh, airport development uh, funding, uh, the multimodal uh, aviation funding is a consideration for you. Uh, so look at, at the aviation uh, funding sources, but also look at non-aviation. Uh, there are two multimodal programs. Uh, the Department of Community Economic Development has one. It requires a separate application. And likewise, PennDOT, outside of, of uh, the Bureau of Aviation, PennDOT has a multimodal. It does likewise require a application. But there are other funding sources like uh, the Appalachian Region Commission, if you're in the Appalachian Regional Area, and uh, U.S. Department of Agriculture and it's rural development uh, if you are a airport that's in a rural area. So both funding uh, sources uh, can be maximized uh, to provide you with the overall local, lowest lo local development cost. Uh, permitting, it's not an easy and it's not a timely consideration. You've got to give yourself plenty of time to get those permits, especially if you're dealing with wetlands. Uh, you may have to deal with a wetland bank or you may have to deal with obviously uh, buying your way out of, of that. Uh, the engineering considerations, uh, again, we talked about code, we talked about municipal. Uh, there's a lot of things that go into hangar development. Just don't look towards that local engineering company knowing all the ins and outs of hangar design and construction. For the construction, we talked about uh, different bid packages and different opportunities uh, for lowering that in value engineering. And lastly, we look in terms of marketing. You've got to be able to have that 
occupancy before you start. Don't use the adage, uh, build it and they will come. That's the sure way of making certain that you're gonna be in a losing proposition. Uh, once the hangar is built, you need to look in terms of that ongoing maintenance, the management of the hangar. And lastly, do that return on investment, the, the decision matrix that I showed you early. Here's some hangers uh, that uh, we have uh, either built or designing or involved with. Uh, this is a, a clear span hanger for a medevac unit. Uh, the next picture shows you the floor plan. There are two large medevac SS-76 helicopters along with all the creature comforts that you need uh, for the medevac staff. Uh, smaller uh, medevac hangar, uh, this one for uh, Lifeline, Penn State. That includes just the hangar itself, small office area and a bathroom. There's box hangars, ones that uh, will accommodate more of the King Air uh, type aircraft as well, just single uh, helicopter and then maybe a modest bathroom with that. Uh, as I mentioned to you, I always recommend uh, an office that is exterior to that. Uh, it doesn't take up all the hangar additional uh, height and it provides you with the clearance between an occupied area and an unoccupied or, or an aircraft storage area. Uh, these are uh, what we call combination hangars. Uh, for uh, New Garden Flying Field, uh, the far end uh, is seven nested T hangers, and on, on the near end are two uh, box hangers. So it provides you with uh, both capabilities for single engine aircraft as well as multi aircraft storage. Uh, likewise, at, at uh, New Garden, we just completed uh, six uh, nested, excuse me, six individual, not nested. They may look like they're nested, but they're actually separated by about 25 feet. Uh, and those are 60 by 60 uh, hangers, uh, individually owned uh, with bifold doors, but we bid them as a package and we bid them in, in cooperation with the airport or the township that owns the airport. Uh, we just broke ground uh, for a uh, hangar uh, for Olympus Air. It's a 16,000 square foot hangar. Uh, because it's greater than 12,000 uh, square feet, that required sprinkling. Uh, we were able to get exemption on the foam uh, fire suppression system with that. I might also mention that the National Fire Protection Association, their technical committee, has seen the light and uh, they are recommending that the foam uh, system be deleted from their code in the 409 section uh, to that. So hopefully that will pass and that will also be a big savings, particularly for those hangers that are greater than 12,000 or greater uh, all the way up to 40,000 uh, square feet. Uh, this is a 12,000 square foot hangar, close by hangar with attached office, very similar to uh, the Bedford hangar. Uh, that one is we're doing uh, at Lancaster Airport. And then uh, at Bedford, Rick mentioned about the hangar survey, but we also, prior to that, we did three, uh, excuse me, two uh, nested uh, uh, 75 by 75 uh, individual hangars uh, to form a 50, 150 by 75 overall building. This is a an aerial view. We, uh, well, once we complete the hangar, we now have uh, a uh, drone capability in our company, and we uh, did take these uh, drone shots uh, for the completed uh, ribbon cutting ceremony. There's our uh, individual information. Both Rick and I will be glad, glad to entertain questions now, but if not, uh, you can send uh, those questions to us uh, or by email or give us a call on our, uh, our cell phone. So uh, Mary, I'll turn it back to you for any questions you may have. All right, so, well, thank you, Fran and Rick. Uh, our first question is, one of the participants is asking if you would please share your presentation notes. And I think you're going to uh, send those. Uh, 
I'm going to be after our after the conclusion today, I will be sending up a, a follow up email to all of the participants. That email will include a recording of today's presentation, as well as the professional development hours form for you to submit for your uh, development hours. Okay. Uh, another one of our participants has a few questions on T hangers. First, uh, the two firms that you called out. Where are their plants? Brent, I'll let you answer that. I think. Okay. Uh, Erected tube <clears throat> Midwest. And, and uh, I'm not so certain in terms of full fats location, but they, they are both uh, available for our region and have uh, produced a number of hangars at various uh, Pennsylvania airports. All right. Um, Mary, I may also say that both have a very good website. Uh, the one particular uh, page within that that I like is that they have a listing of all of the aircraft uh, that is commercially produced. And then they show the size of the hangar and the type of hangar that should be considered for that aircraft. So a very good uh, planning tool. All right. I'd also like to remind our participants to please use the Q&A function if they have a question. Because this is a webinar, we are unable to call on you because your camera and your uh, microphone are turned off. So we will not be able to call on you. So please use the Q&A. Another question is, what is the lead time to get a pre-engineered tea hanger? <laughs> Probably, yeah. oh, it's at least six months, more likely nine, I would think at this point. Once, um, once, you, once you put in the order, you're, you're talking today in today's market about six to nine months, right. closer to nine months, then, then six. And, and to do a hangar project you know, from start to finish, if, if you were to call one of us today and say, hey, I wanna build a hangar. If we started tomorrow, um, Realistically, you're looking at a minimum, probably 18 months. Uh, you know, a lot of it would depend on whether you have a pad ready site or anything like that, or if you would already have land development approval. But you know, if we were starting from scratch, minimum probably 18 months to two to two years from day one till complete till you cut that ribbon and, and put your first aircraft in that hangar. Yeah, the other key thing to that is that you need to know the hangar before you do the foundation design. So the earlier you can procure that hangar, obviously the better in terms of, of timing, both in terms of delivery, uh, holding in the cost, but also uh, being able to, to put together the bid package uh, for the hangar foundation uh, floor and, and, and the erection of the hangar itself. I also say, Mary, I do now have uh, the location of Full Fab. They're located in Canton, Ohio. Yes, and one of our participants also shared that information. So thank you, Fran, and, and thank you, uh, Mr. Kelly. Uh, another question is, what is the warranty and expected service life for the small tea hangers? <laughs> well, the, war the warranty... Uh, the warranty that you're going to get is, is only in terms of the manufacturer. Uh, and, and most manufacturers, if you're dealing with full fab rectitude, tube, uh, will, will give, give you uh, that, that warranty considerations. You can, you can purchase uh, any, any number of years, uh, particularly uh, I, I recommend that you want to look at, at a warranty that would be a minimum of 10 years and, and maybe that of, of, of 20. Uh, but uh, if, if, in fact, uh, you're going to be uh, only uh, assuming the ownership of that hangar after the uh, lease expires, uh, you, you want to also look into purchasing extended warranties uh, for your consideration. And as right. the lifespan goes, uh, you know, a lot of that is, depends on your maintenance. If, if you ignore it, uh, it's just like anything else. If you ignore your maintenance, it's not going to last as long. Um, you know, tea hangers typically minimum probably 30 years 
Uh, we've seen, you know, I, I haven't been around long enough, but I, you know, I know hangers, tea hangers that have been around since the 60s, uh, maybe even the 50s. So, you know, properly maintained, you can get a good 30 to 50 years out of, out of tea hangers and, uh, and they'll, they'll still be very functional. You want to make certain that within your ground lease, you have a clause that allows you to do annual inspections. And, and any, any deficiencies that are resulting from that, that that particular tenant or owner uh, would have to make those corrections within a certain specified amount of days. All right, um, I have one more question here and uh, all the other participants, feel free to submit anything else you have, or this may be our last question. We'll wrap up and let Rick get on with his his day, I, I heard a rumor he's going to get trees. Uh, our last question is, how has the pandemic affected the costs of hangar construction? Big time. Uh, we bid projects, uh, hangar projects in uh, the February uh, timeframe of this year. And uh, we got the opportunity then to immediately put down a deposit and order for steel and, and held uh, the price. And in March, we started bidding another project. And with that, we were getting calls almost on a daily basis from uh, contractors, citing that uh, they were getting 5% increases uh, every week. Uh, when we were bidding projects in, in May and April, uh, those prices uh, escalated to about 30%. Uh, and now with the delivery, it's uh, in question as to what timing we'll actually get the steel and when, when we can actually complete the project. So the pandemic- Just to give everyone a, an idea, the, uh, the hangar that we did at Bedford County Airport, is 12,000 square feet. Um, I believe the hangar itself was 2.4 million. That one was finished last fall. That was- kind of prior to the, the massive increases that we've seen in the last really six to eight months. Uh, that same hangar now is probably more in the $3 million range yeah. you know, constructed. So uh, prices have gone up pretty dramatically. Yeah, we would hope that uh, with the introduction of uh, steel uh, from foreign countries it would not help us in terms of the Buy America clause, uh, but certainly it, it would help in terms of the overall inventory of steel uh, lowering costs, but also uh, manufacturers as they get back into full swing, we would like to think that in 2022, at least uh, th this time next year, that we may be I wouldn't say back to normal, but I would certainly say that it would be in a more advantageous uh, area for bidding. For, for T hangers, the, the typical price is roughly, and it, again, it depends on what you're, you know, what you're building and, and, and uh, what your selections are, but we usually use a, a, uh, a financing idea of about $60,000 to $100,000 per unit for, for tea hangers. And, uh, you know, so that just gives you a little idea of what the costs are. Now that is, that is publicly funded too, so. Yeah, just a rule of thumb prior to the pandemic, uh, again, for tea hangers, uh, the decision matrix would say that if you can't get 300 hours a month, it's probably not a good business decision. However, uh, the Aviation uh, Hangar Committee, uh, we are working on several recommendations. And one of those recommendations uh, is to possibly increase the state portion uh, of a hangar grant from 50% to 75% for those GA airports or those airports that are, are financially in, in a challenging situation which could make that lower lower decision uh, point in, in that matrix. OK, 
Okay, well, Rick and Fran, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for sharing your expertise. Uh, you're always a pleasure to speak with. And again, to remind the attendees, please look for an email from the Aviation Council this afternoon as a follow-up, which will contain your professional development hours form and a recording of this session. All right. Have a good day, everyone. Thank Take you, care. everyone. All right. Bye.